All right, hello everybody. Welcome to another uh, edition of the Tonic Seven. Well, Tonic Five today, but uh, the other two are with us in spirit. We're going to be talking about China and the United States and the convergence between them. There's an article by NS Lyons and uh, Substack called "The Upheaval" that's uh, specifically going to set the stage for this discussion. But a lot of people have been noticing of late the Communist Party of China and the Communist Party of the United States, aka the Democrats and many of the Republicans, uh, seem to be converging in the way they address certain social and economic issues. Um, and John Carter has some thoughts on this article, so he's going to start us off. Go ahead, John. Yeah, so um, Ed Lyon's uh, article kind of really hit dissident substack uh, like a nuke when it came out last week, um, I had three people on, here on Deimos like independently message me and, and say, you have to read this. This is got to be the iron ring in your, in your weekly roundup. This is so good. Um, and uh, I actually gave it the iron ring without actually reading it. Cause I kind of glanced at it. I was like, Oh, this is actually going to be really good. So that may have predisposed me to enjoy the piece. I know Mark had some issues with it, but um, the, the 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 title is not misleading, but you could maybe get the idea that he's talking. He's going to talk about how uh, you know the Chinese Communist Party is infiltrating the U.S. and bribing Biden or something like that. You know, kind of like Fox News talking points. Um, but it's it's not about that at all. It's actually not even really about China. It's about the managerial state. Uh, and by state, he does not mean simply the government. He means the entire system that we live under. Curtis Yarvin would call it the cathedral. Um, the, the people call it the blob. You know, there's all the, the Iron Pentagon. I've heard it referred to as that. It's sort of the system that pervades academia, the corporate sector, uh, the media, um, and of course, the entirety of the public sector, in particular, the uh, uh, the permanent government. Um, and what I found valuable in this piece is that it, I, I thought it was one of the, the best uh, descriptions of the managerial state that I'd ever come across. He kind of very systematically goes through it. Um, looks at its primary features uh, at an ideological and structural level, um, analyzes how this plays out uh, in terms of its interaction with society, and its effect on human psychology. It's uh, both of the, the managerial class themselves as well as their subjects. And uh, then um, towards the end, kind of speculates as to, okay, you know, where is this going, which he thinks is sort of the total techno state, just the, the, uh, the absolute management of every like, micromanagement of every aspect of human existence. And the reason he called it the China Convergence, um, I, presumably not just to uh, get people to click on it, but also, uh, you know, throughout the article, he kind of goes back and forth comparing the U.S. and China, because, of course, in uh, the West, we like to think of ourselves as the free world. And China is like the totalitarian uh, communist hellhole, right? And we're so much better and we're so much freer. And we have so much more liberty than they do. And the point that he makes is that communism and managerial capitalism are really both managerial systems at root. They simply have a disagreement over uh, the methods that should be used, um, where uh, you know, in China, they tend to prefer uh, harder methods, um, you know, more direct use of force, prisons, uh, the, the state propaganda tends to be a little bit more heavy handed, um, you know, very similar to how it was in the Soviet Union. Whereas in the West, they tend to prefer uh, more subtle methods using nudge tactics to in, in incentive structures and, uh, and public relations and so on in order to sort of massage the population into going the direction they want. But, Lyons argues, 
um, that as time is going on, under the sort of selective pressures of uh, technology and um, interstate competition, the two, the U.S. and China, are increasingly coming to resemble one another. So the U.S. is becoming um, increasingly willing to use kind of direct force to repress its citizens. China is getting more subtle in how it manages their citizens. Uh, you know, for instance, you know, relying on a, the, um, it's called the social credit system uh, to use a, using AI to monitor people's behavior and then kind of gamifying society in order to um, promote behavior that they want to see and discourage behavior they don't want to see uh, through this, this whole system of surveillance. And of course, in the West, we don't have anything like that formally but we have an informal social credit system where, you know, again, you're always being watched by everyone on social media and anything you say can be used against you. And if you sort of go against the, the party line, um, you're increasingly, you, you kind of get sidelined and you start losing it on opportunities and you kind of realize that without being told. So of course you conform to what you intuitively realize are the uh, the expectations um so yeah i think that's it's it's, it's a really hard one to summarize this thing was i think the longest essay i have ever read on substack uh so the, the reading time was like 155 minutes um according to, according to the uh the the little the, the uh annotation um in the inbox uh so that that the, about twice the length of the billionaire psycho piece we talked about here a couple of weeks ago um so yeah summarizing it is tricky but i think that sort of gives a reasonable overview uh so mark i know you said you didn't like it so what were your problems with it hey okay uh well first of all i'd like to say i don't like it uh, let me preface by saying that I'm I'm broadly unfamiliar with this author's work. So um, many of the reasons that I didn't like it had to do, if likes the right word, had to do with what I thought was missing, which I thought were the most important components. Like you said, this is a very, very long piece. It was comprehensive or attempted to be comprehensive. And um, and And at the same time, when I got to the end of it, I had several questions. First of all, who was this for? Who was it written for? And what was the what was the end purpose of it? Other than, again, uh, forming a comprehensive language model with which to view the problem and the threat. And at the end of it, I also just kind of thought, like, well, he's missed the mark. He has not he has not identified the actual threat. Uh, and there are several reasons for that. But the, I, I think I want to start with the list of the managerial ideology, he was calling it. Uh, this is the list that begins with um, technocratic scientism. It goes on to utopianism, uh, meliorism, uh, liberationism, hedonistic materialism, et cetera, et cetera. It goes to seven. Um, I think the seventh is abstraction and dematerialization, which I've written about, as you gentlemen know. Um, and he leaves out the most important one. And here's what I think is the most important aspect of everything that we see going on with what he calls a system and approaches as a system, as an automated emergent system. Um, the eighth commandment, you could call it, in this managerial ideology, which is unlisted, by the, and, and, and which is unmentioned, by the way, I think, largely or completely by the people who promote this ethos or anti-ethos or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think that's the commandment that overrides all of the rest of these, these categories, you know, either individually or as a group. And if I had to slap a label on it, you know, that kind of jives with the author's writing style, I might call it something like um, unconfessed individualism. Uh, but what but what it really is is a kind of a blend of postmodern YOLOism and 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 what Aleister Crowley called his creed of 
do what thou will. And that overrides each and every one of these in the moment, at any moment, on a whim. Everyone who promotes this, in other words, like when I say the rule is hidden, I mean from each other. Everyone in this system, and 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 maybe in some cases even from themselves, you know, that's something where it's like spectral evidence, you know, man, you, you know, you're doing some intense mind reading to figure that out. But I think I think what best explains the, and this is left out too, and it was frustrating, it, it, not completely left out. He he touches on it here and there. He touches on the absurdity of like some of what we see, um, the clown world aspects of the managerial regime. I think we might call them. You know, all of these insane contradictions and hypocrisies. Um, and at the bottom of it all, I think, you know, very few of these people actually believe in the utopian efficiency curve, the this telic um, uh, efficiency curve that rises to, I guess, infinity. I don't know. I don't think they know either. I think, I think at the bottom of it all, what we're looking at, very few of them believe in it or even in the idea of progress itself. Uh, or rather, you know, they they treat these things as inseparable from their own desires, often hidden desires uh, for comfort, dominance, you know, power, all at the individual level. That's what's going on behind the curtain. We're just seeing the show, the magic show up front, you know, these spells of words. Uh, so, so any one of, you know, the other principles, again, overridden in a heartbeat, the moment it conflicts with this unspoken prime directive that's at the heart of all evil people and enterprises you know the you know and then and then whatever the contradiction or hypocrisy is it's just papered over with some i don't know hasty ex post facto rationale which looks totally hilarious to all of us outside of the cult that's the clown aspect and maybe maybe even to people inside of it again we can't know but you know they would never laugh out loud because you know they they fear that their own hidden directives would be exposed you know, this is a cult of liars that we're dealing with, ultimately. And so if you accept the existence, you know, of this ethos as the you know, this individual, unconfessed, individualist, hedonist um, hunger as the, as the ultimate override note and the true nature of the monster, of the threat, I think, I think you, see all, you start to see all of the other utilitarian nonsense as kind of like, armor and camouflage for that you know then you're essentially looking at a network of sam harris's and sam bankman freeds a bunch of you know anxiety ridden nihilistic midwit fraudsters trying to you know quietly ascend these dominance hierarchies in the background well in in the forefront which is what the author intends to uh they're preaching these fake gospels of utility and progress and etc um, and I think that's why the managerial regime is is self sabotaging before our eyes. It's it's you know based on its own stated efficiency goals. You know why this is why trains full of chemicals are derailing and then getting turned into fucking poison mushroom clouds in the middle of the country um, by our own military. It's it's why a foreign spy balloons hang hung out over nuclear weapons sites. You know it's why we blundered into this proxy war with Ukraine that is going to be a huge fucking disaster. It's not just that they're incompetent. Uh, it's it's that they're none of them are confessing what they actually believe and want, even to each other. Um, you know, like they, they, when people say, "Oh, it's not a conspiracy," I kind of get what they mean. I get the fact that like they're going to talk in code even to each other. You know, these are these are very fearful people. Nihilism brings fear with it big time um, because they see nothing apart from the flesh. And, you know, okay. and so now let me be fair, because I've, I've given given it a lot of guff, um, because I, I remember that about the middle of this very long piece, um, he kind of touches on a little bit of this. Uh, and when I, when I finally got to it, it came off as kind of a buried lead, because then he races right back into procedures and feedback and automation loops and, and all of this other sort of overly technical explanation for what we're seeing which appears to be mostly a loser, even to the people that are using these tactics. And, and when he talks about what the, he says things like, here's what the regime really wants. You know, he seems to think it's, you know, basically something like oligarchical power, which in some ways it is, but it's always, it wants this or it wants that, you know, it meaning the system, like that the system can somehow desire a thing. 
that it can have a will of its own. You know, and at the very least, that's not in my in my mind. It's not a very good way of describing will or desire, uh, particularly when it comes to mankind. Uh, you know, but I think just to, I mean, I know I'm going on, but it's it's much worse than that to me. You know, I think what cripples the whole article for me uh, is that like Eric had a big problem with the Pygmalion art article, right? Because he said he wrote that essentially like he thought it was rambling. He thought it was disorganized. I had the opposite problem with this one. It's not rambling at all. It's in fact, it's very well ordered and structured. Um, it's like the, you know, again, he's trying to build this model with, with, with which to discuss the threat, which is what we're all trying to do. But you think this is another one of those sort of missing the forest for trees kind of deal, you know, it's like he has this whole stirring and treaty at the end about like how we must confront evil and how much, you know, and it's, he's described this whole octopus and like it's a mechanical thing and it's, it's a, it has emergent behaviors and it's automated. Um, but he leaves out the, the the concept of evil entirely. You know, what what evil is, what it does to a person, to an individual over time. Like he talks about, for instance, he talks about Mao's big murderous social engineering plans and his techno managerial schemes. But he never mentions, you know, that he was a smelly old pervert who was addicted to whores. You know, he talks about Marx, but he never mentions the fact that he was a lazy parasite living off of his buddy's dad. You know, he talks about all these so-called like devoted communist apparatchiks, but he never, he never really questions who or what it is that most of them are really devoted to underneath all the bullshit because it's bullshit. He see, you know, it's like he sees and he ornately describes the tales that are wagging, but he doesn't see, he, he seems to not see the dogs at all. I think, I, and that's something that I think is alarmingly common in our ranks. We're going to call ourselves the dissidents. That's huge. It's a huge problem, that lack of, of, of sight or insight. I mean, I think, I think, and I'm not sure, but I think many of you agree that it isn't really communism that these people are devoted to or, or an ideology of any kind. I, I, and I would say they are devoted to evil itself because at the root, Underneath all of this claptrap, this ideological um, pretend game that they're playing, it's it's just all of the cardinal sins, like just smashed into one big amorphous blob of of self deification and mechanization of other. Like when they describe humans as programmable machines, they don't they don't it's really kind of... mean themselves. Not not one of them actually believes that. Not ever. Even a really, really dumb atheist like Sam Harris is quietly, you know, the false god of his own world. You know, he's both the object and the idol for worship and also the thing being worshipped. He sees everyone else as a machine. That's what he's describing. That's the warped and, and short-sighted and half-blind worldview that these people are committed to in an unspoken way. You know, and if you have this state of false godhood, hypocrisy, and shameless, self-interested lies. Does that remind you, any of you, of any notorious biblical figures, by the way? And if so, you know, welcome to the party, pal. Yeah, but but even if you believe that the devil is only a metaphor, or or as the author seems to think, the icon of some kind of form of emergent human mechanical system, I think I think you can see a problem, you know, even there with the way certain elements of this threat are diagnosed. Like the whole essay is littered with the enemy's language. He's always describing the enemy's actions as automated, emergent. It's always the rational, un unconscious software of the wolf pack that he's examining. It's never the irrational, shape shifting werewolf. Never. And, and even the wolf pack analogy, probably, you know, even the wolf pack itself probably isn't as automated as we think. I mean, for all we know, each, each wolf secretly sees itself as the true alpha biding his time until the opportunity presents itself for a big old so, coup. So, we don't know. So, yeah, go ahead. Would it, would, it, would it be fair to say uh, that uh, the managerial system as something which is completely oriented around power and, and really nothing in control, I mean, by its very definition, that's all it's about. Uh, would this not be like the perfect matrix within which to have a ponerogenic event of unprecedented scale take place. Um, and, uh, booting that one over to explain, you there. Explain yourself. Well, yeah, like, what do you mean by that? So, well, I mean, like, it's like, 
psychopaths, sociopaths, narcissists, like all all kind of characteropathic, you know, broken people um, in the human population uh, are attracted to power over others like flies to shit. And, uh, you know, they're generally very good liars. They're into self-aggrandizement, you know, all of these kinds of uh, nasty things. And these are all the traits of the managerial system, right? Um, you know, you have this free-floating narrative that, you know, is completely disconnected from reality, uh, where the only ideas that propagate within it are the ones that are going to lead to an increase in power in the system by getting other people in the system an excuse to extend their power over others even further. Um, climate change being a great example of that. It's very popular because... It gives all of them an excuse to micromanage the shit out of everything, right? Um, and, uh, you know, the, the lying in general, just the fact that you don't have to worry about whether or not what you're saying is remotely true. Again, you know, psychopaths love that. Um, so, I mean, you have this ideology that seems almost perfectly designed to attract that kind of person. And, you know, here we are in, you know, late modernity and, uh, and everything's falling apart. Um, and, uh, oh, we just lost it. Uh, and, and we, we do seem to be seeing, I think, like a pathocratic, uh, like a ponerogenic event taking place on a vast scale. Um, so, you know, I, I actually have a hard time thinking of, a, of an ideology or a system that would be better designed, uh, than that. And like, well, that's, that's the thing. Can a and, psychopath and have an it, ideology? It, 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 and and then if if I mean does a psychopath have an ideology? Uh, not they don't usually be, they're not true believers, right? But it's more and there's, like they, and there's not many of them. No, but they they there's not many it. of them. They, yeah. they, they they use it, and of course, like they're and you you alluded to the myth of progress, right? How like they use that as kind of one of their one of their main sort of propaganda hooks is like this upwards development of the human species and everything is getting better over time and. You know, just leave it in our hands and you'll live in utopia, right? Um, well, this is exactly the kind of uh, the kind of seduction that uh, these kinds of ideologies will use. Um, the kind of promises. Right. I, I like that. I like better that you, know, you when, use when, the... they're, when they're like love bombing you, right? And then you have uh, the the uh, you, you 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 mentioned the YOLO aspect, right? So Lyons actually does talk this is one of the parts that stuck with me I, I found it quite prominent in fact when he discusses um the like psycho spiritual effect of uh the kind of consumer imperatives of you know uh just kind of like just treat yourself um give yourself what you want you know like don't don't exercise any self-discipline uh because of course this is very good for capitalism like if you can't regulate your spending habits or whatever uh then um you spend more money obviously but also it makes you easier to control because now you're you're enslaved to your animal desires you have no self-governance right and this is and the, the the influence of this he kind of argues is uh you know how you go from having um a virtuous republic of self-governing citizens as the united states was a century ago to a country full of vapid children such as it has become now huh. who um, I, see, I, because, I agree with that I, part of i agree with that part yeah, of what yeah. he was saying but he's not describing like, the like, elites he's describing their victims yeah, the, yeah, elites, yeah, yeah, the yeah. part where he describes yeah, yeah. the elites and the elite managerial regime is where i have the problem because well, i think saying, again like there's not what, a, what, yeah, what, 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 what i'm saying is like that 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 these all these kinds of effects are like the, the sort of like if you had a group of like really subtle psych sociopaths, like very like you know high functioning and so on, like you know this is kind of what I think they would do. Um, like it's it's at, and I I think it is evil, like in the spiritual sense, it is extremely evil. I have a hard time actually picturing something which is more insidious and disgusting. So so Harrison, I wanted to tag you on that, not just because I was talking about like, you know, ponderology, yeah. which is your bailiwick, but also because you had that article uh, just a couple of weeks ago about um, mm -hmm. sort of reconciling uh, uh, ponderology with spiritual evil. Um, mm -hmm. 
So I thought maybe you might have some some sort of thoughts on that that could like tie together what uh, what, what Mark has been talking about. Well, maybe I, I've got a couple of questions first. So, well, well, first I'll make an observation just so I can say something. But <laughs> on the <clears throat> on the topic of kind of of ideologies and psychopaths and going back to some things that Mark was saying, like in his criticism criticism of this article, just so like listeners and viewers know, I haven't read it yet, so I can't comment to you know the the actual content of the article just uh, on what we're discussing but it reminded me well one of the things about uh, psychopaths and pathocracy and like you, you guys already alluded to about ideology is that the the ideology for psychopaths is is a mask it is something that they use instrumentally for a certain purpose and there's no there's no real attachment to the to the ideology they don't actually believe it so i, I think this kind of goes back to some of the things mark was saying but also, like what Lobachevsky at least says, so this is this is kind of one of his, let's, you can call it a hypothesis, that the ideologies that are most useful to psychopaths are actually the ones that contain um, the most, in a sense, creative potential. Not that they're actually good ideologies in and of themselves that would ever, ever work, but there's something about them that, that um, like hooks into people that, that actually lets normal people or that evokes from normal people a sense of okay well this this is something that we can get behind because any ideology needs normal people uh needs the power needs the energy and like motivation from normal people to to propagate you can't just uh like you you can't just propagate a a, a mafia ideology to the masses and expect them to get behind it and and for this group of psychopaths to gain power they have to pretend to be human they have to they have to couch themselves in some kind of um, some, in something that's relatable in some sense. So that, that's, I'm just gonna, just going to throw that out there as a bracket to maybe consider. Um, but my so my question about this is the question I've I've had even after reading like um, I didn't read Burnham's The Managerial Class, but I've read you know stuff about it and I've read other things you know other things by Burnham. But what which, exactly which just to interject like like he yeah. Lyons talks about Burnham extensively. He 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 say that again. He talks of he he, he references Burnham exten extensively. Yeah, because yeah, Burnham wrote the like the you know the, the first book on the the takeover of the managerial class back in the what was it like the thirties or something or the forties. But but my question is, what actually differentiates a manager from any from anyone else? Like, what actually is is the managerial prototype? And I like I know that McConkie has written about this and he's got his ideas, but I want to know like like us here what what is the feature so you can look at someone and say okay that person's managerial this person isn't managerial because i i want to know that before i can kind of like comment on what i think is actually going I, on with I this think was, managerial class yeah i think what uh what ennis lines was uh or how he was describing it um if i if i summarize it in in my own words it would probably be something like uh someone who follows um procedures and technique um as opposed to let's say um you know organic leadership or something like that right because you always have some leadership but i guess the difference is that the archetypical manager he he has a he comes up or or um takes a, a procedure that he gets from somewhere and acts basically like an algorithm um, like a human algorithm right um writing it all down forcing everybody to comply you know coming up with compliance policies and policies for this and that procedures um tries to make it more effective um increase the the bottom line the output blah 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 and mm -hmm. also so that kind of thing okay. as, so as, yeah as opposed to let's say someone who like imagine your typical like patriarch patriarchal um company boss right who runs his team you know like just organically and just uh, you know mm -hmm. something like that okay well well does is there is there a place for managers in this world do they serve any any purpose like if we were to totally eliminate all managers um what what would be what would be out, the outcome so like what is the proper place in in social in the social structure for a managerial type if any is there one like can we operate well, without I, I, well, I mean like the, the, like the justification for it initially um was the coordination of, of complex systems uh mm -hmm. rendering them sort of like you know, more systematic more efficient um 
I mean, it got its start, I think it got its start, from what I've read, in uh, the slave economies in the South, uh, where like, they, these kind of consultants would be brought in to um, rationalize techniques on the plantation in order to you know, make the, the plantation more effective. And then, you know, it goes from there to the whole idea of, uh, you know, um, breaking every process, every like manufacturing process down into like a series of defined steps and then uh, having individual workers responsible for each step of the process rather than like an artisanal method where a, an individual creative uh, um, artisan, <laughs> trying to give a different word there, uh, would sort of like take the whole process himself to start to finish. Um, because, you know, this would be more efficient. You can make more units per unit time. Uh, and, yeah, that was. I mean, like that, so it, I mean, managerialism didn't really start as an ideology. It was more like manufacturing techniques, and I think that was kind of its um, its power. Almost was that it it was presenting itself as this kind of apolitical uh, system that would just make things better, regardless of what your politics happened to be. Um, you know this will be useful and you know then as enterprises got larger and more complex you know, especially once you start having like the telegraph wire and the railways uh extending expanding the scale of enterprises of, of like you know international levels um it becomes See, more think... like that coordination becomes more and more important uh in order to enable things to just like cohere and, so which and don't, i mean don't forget that, the... it, modern warfare as well right oh yeah requires yeah. oh yeah i would like to yeah 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 well, this is what one because like it's like, i'm glad that you like, said absolutely. modern uh-huh sure, go ahead. Go ahead, no 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 i was just gonna say i'm glad that he said modern because like I, I kind of agree with what everybody's saying but like i think these are just the most modern versions of something that's quite a bit older and and it has to do with organization yeah, well, like, in, in general. In, in, so, in a sense, I think I think like the managerial well, class is but, just the latest kind of like administrative class, right? And like every large right. so, empire has always had its administrative. Correct. I was going to say. I was yeah. going to say that it's it's any intermediary between decision and execution, and so that mm. would go back to even Alexander the Great, like as he marched on uh, and on his campaigns, like there was going to be a decision at a certain mode node. And then there would be a series of intermediaries, administrators, overseers, and also, by the way, scapegoats and everything the hell else that you could think of, like on the path from decision to execution. Um, and so like that body of, of um, that species of organizational unit, I think, has existed forever. Like, like in other words, or as long as anything that we could call a complex collective action or organizational structure has existed which we can't know yeah. it even, could go even, back way I mean, before heck, language even uh, yeah, or what we would recognize people uh have uh you know like streamlined divination back in the days i mean <laughs> and made it more efficient I yeah mean, these kind of things um they're probably as old as uh any form of civilization that goes beyond you know like a certain small group um and uh certain division of labor you know that that goes along with it well so okay so i, th I think that even if uh, like this is my hypothesis at the time that the managerial type is pretty much like a constant of of human nature and like the, and human variation and even if we go back to times of like you know hunter gatherers and small tribes you're still going to see a type of managerialism where someone looks at you know a group of people doing an activity and says no you're doing this wrong you do this you do this and then we do this and then and then we'll go over and we'll and we'll we'll kill this bison or whatever. Like there's there's going to be even like a but that used to be a leader, right? Well, but I'm saying that well, that's you're yeah. describing a leader if he's doing it directly. So so speaking right. of hunter right. gatherers, right. like as we were talking about, like you know, how far back does this go? Um, I I just found out recently that apparently back in like the Upper Paleolithic, you had in Europe these uh, organized mining. Um, operations that would sort of be like systematically like digging into the earth like looking for the highest quality flint or obsidian or whatever and then trading this stuff like across the entire continent and uh like 
which is a much higher level of social organization and sort of like sophistication and planning than you we would normally associate with uh with stone age hunter gatherers um but yeah, it's very likely they did have some kind of okay. administrative class to sort of make that possible. Okay, so so take it back back to the modern times, and if you look at like companies, so Luke, you were giving an example of like organic versus kind of totally bureaucratized groups, and I, th I think that a, at a certain level of organization, uh, at least you know I don't have a lot of corporate experience, but from what I've heard other people say, you know, you have this this startup with uh, you know a small group of people. And then it gets large enough that the original people that had made it just don't know what to do and can't and can't manage it like a, a good creator isn't necessarily a good manager, for instance, so then they hire someone that kind of acts as that administrator in the you know below them that can then. Um, just do certain types of things that things that aren't in the um, you know aren't in the mental toolkit of the, the entrepreneurial creative type that made the company. I'm just going to take that as a given. Maybe it's not true. Maybe, maybe they're. No, I think that, I think you're completely, I think you're absolutely correct about that. And that, that, that's, okay. you know, that, you know, if you, if you go back to the 19th century when managerialism really got rolling um, or, or first got rolling, that's kind of exactly what was happening. And you had these enterprises that were started up by the actual sort of, you know, visionary founders. Um, you had uh, include or and you had like you know things like your landed gentry who would you know be in charge of these big agricultural estates, and they just couldn't like they they it, it, their enterprises got too large for them to oversee personally, so they had mm -hmm. to bring in these specialists in right. managing you know the factory or whatever right, and okay. then over and then over time, sort of. I think it sort of really hit its peak, or not its peak, but uh, the the transfer of power seems to have occurred sort of around World War One. Uh, the uh, the managerial class who would be brought in as kind of helpers basically ended up in charge of everything. Right. Right. Yeah. So this is so this like, is what I was going. This is what I was getting at, and that was and this was I think Burnham's point in in his book, which I didn't read, is that the manager like so so the middlemen essentially became the new ruling class. So they yes. kind of supplant the people supplanted the people that should be kind of directing them and keeping them in check and and keeping them in a certain direction. And so when you get when you get a middleman who's strictly procedural, who then becomes the top man, who's then directing everything, it's kind of like he loses he loses in, in a sense his his conscience represented as a as the you know what who should be the person directing him and making sure that he stays kind of stays in line just to, to put it's it almost simple. like the uh the the emissary taking the place of right. the master right exactly but I, I guess this is my problem though is that these people these people might all be wearing skins and cloaks like in other words we look at it and we say mm -hmm. okay these are the administrative class that has taken over when it, in reality it's just the same wolves as before right, right. just okay. wearing a different skin um it, it, just to, just because I, I have some more criticism i i don't know if it like part, part of my criticism is again tactical here it's just kind of like are we naming the correct threat are we really identifying what what it is that we're fighting or are we like hercules are we just hacking off at the same we're just hacking off a new bunch of snakeheads that we see without recognizing how they're all well, tied this together is, what the root so is Mark, this is this, this is what makes the managerial system so frustrating right um because so if you think of like earlier forms of tyranny like you know for instance under like a bad king or whatever it's like okay what's the problem well, the problem is we have a bad king it's that guy there he, he's a bad person and you know okay we just have to get rid of him you know to, to make to really oversimplify it whereas the the essence of how the managerial class operates because they are middlemen they uh sort of by nature um they sort of blend into the bureaucracy they uh they never take direct responsibility for anything it's always you know oh it was someone else or uh, oh, I'm just following procedure, you know, computer says so, so I do this. Um, there's never any one person that you can point at. And even their language is this kind of like cloud of, it, it's like designed to 
to put you to sleep, you know, or like make your eyelids grow heavy because it's so so boring and non-comedal and so vague and empty of any direct meaning. That's what I mean. Yeah, execution spells of words. Yeah. Oh, dude, it's okay, part well, of the black speech of Mordor, like as you would put it. It, it is. Like, cop, so, so, so you have you have this kind of this kind of amorphous thing, right? And then you can, and then you you want to believe there's something behind it directing it. And I'm not saying there isn't. I I I strongly suspect that there is, and you're correct about okay. that. Um, okay. Okay. But but it's yeah, go. Okay, well, if, if finish up really quick, if, but I, I want to. I was just going to say, like, what, it, it, what what makes this like so uh, so frustrating, and what causes this this endless cycle inside the discourse of like, is it a system or is it a conspiracy? Like, you know, uh, is it is it an emergent phenomenon or is it spiritual evil or whatever? Is that it has made itself so deliberately opaque? It's so like we're all, we're almost all in the position of like Kremlin Kremlin Kremlinologists trying to like read the tea leaves about like, you know, what's happening inside the Politburo based on like, you know, like, uh, you know, the facial expression of the fucking party secretary during the last, you know, general meeting or something. Cause like there's so little real information coming out of it. Um, so yeah, that's basically what I want to say. Okay. So, so uh, I, I won't succeed, but I'll, I'll, I'll start an attempt to kind of reconcile the, the viewpoints like you were suggesting. So I, I would say based on the discussion we've been having that managerialism in and of itself is neutral to slightly negative. Like it's not totally evil, but it's pretty annoying. Like if you've got a, a manager that's just like by the book procedural, it's like, okay, that guy's annoying, but he's not going to like um, ruin your life and, um, you know, kill your family and just totally totally exploit you like you can have a fair manager or you can have a, a dick manager or you can have like a, a great manager like it's the the managerialism in a, in and of itself is kind of it can it can go in multiple directions which is which is kind of like well like you said so who's who's ruling the managerial class we, we were talking about how the manage the managers took over the manager the managers according to to burnham are the new the new ruling class well, it, when you put this amorphous thing into a, a ruling position, then, you know, it can still operate just in a kind of annoying way. It's like, oh, those those annoying bureaucrats, I have to fill out these 30 forms to, to do this thing. It's annoying, but it's not necessarily, you know, it's not necessarily evil, like evil in the sense of um, overwhelmingly evil. You could you could argue that, it, yeah, it is inherently evil, <laughs> you know, maybe, um, but it's like evil in the screw tape, the screw tape sense of evil, like like right. small evil spread over a vast area, and like you know, adding up to like a vast amount of evil. Right, but well, I mean, like the, when he that, talks, when he talks about the good, sorry. Well, well, that that opens itself up for, for um for the real ventriloquism, like that's to use McConkie's word, like when when you have this amorphousness, then. That and I think this gets back to what you were saying, John, about this being the perfect kind of breeding ground for pathocracy is that it then provides that amorphous kind of um, um, you don't know what you're looking at, the, the words don't make sense, and well, that's a perfect environment for for like a, a psychopathic personality who is expert at um, hiding behind words they don't mean, at presenting a certain face to the public, uh, you know, PR. Makes when you have a when you have a, a a PR culture, like uh, public relations culture that is founded on not saying what you actually mean, then of course you're going to get psychopaths who don't say what they mean and do it very deliberately and purposefully and know what they're doing and, and do it consciously. Of course they're going to be the ones that can that can get into that system and 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 use it to their advantage. And of course, so you you mentioned my article and and what's behind that? Well, we could go e even deeper and, and you know you know. Mark laid it out at the very beginning. There's a there's a there's another level to 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 that whole yeah. process. But I'd say it's not managerialism like in and of itself. Managerialism when when untethered by um, by the master by the by a, a person with like wisdom and vision who who knows what the actual direction that this should be going in. When that master is removed and the emissary is put in his place, then that puts the that puts the the emissary in the it makes them an easy target for the devil. 
I'll just put it yeah, that way. But may, I, I want to say something about the, you know, like the, this just, I just thought about it. And um, I think, um, you know, if, if we ask the question, who's to blame, you know, um, I mean, who's, who's the, who's behind it all. Um, and I would say one answer uh, could be us basically. Right. Because uh, the thing is um, in the article, that's maybe a, a slight criticism that I have too. you know, at some point he, he made it uh, sound uh, like, you know, the, the managerial class, like turns everybody into children, basically, right. And, and that's certainly true as far as it goes. But um, what if, you know, we actually have summoned those guys, you know, s summon those demons in a sense, because we actually want to be treated like children, right? I mean, this is uh, seems to be kind of a, uh, there seems to be something to it. So when people get sloppy, you know, like um, uh, maybe lose their, or uh, how you say, like um, get, uh, uh, lose their strength, um, their cap capability for virtue, for for self control, for moral sufficiency, as as I like to call it. Right, uh, I think that's a good word, like being more morally sufficient, which is also kind of dangerous, right? And it's kind of um, it's it's hard, and uh, you would have to accept that you have to take care of yourself. You know, it's daddy uh, won't protect you. Um, so, and so, so Luke, on those lines, uh, exactly those lines. So when Harrison's talking about, like, you know, the manager is not going to kill you, right? Uh, it's not like the the the, the commissars or whatever, um, and like the NKVD. Uh, he's annoying, but okay. I kind of think of them more as like heroin dealers, right? So you know, you have this feedback loop between the heroin dealer and the customers, where like. You know that every customer of a heroin dealer had a moment where he decided, "I'm going to do heroin," and you know whatever the reason was for that, right? Like maybe he was bored, maybe he, uh, maybe it didn't start with heroin. Maybe it started with oxycontin, and his doctor prescribed it to him for back pain or something. Right? There's always that. There's always a reason. Uh, there a good reason or a bad reason. Um, and then after. He gets addicted, which happens quite quickly. He finds himself in this kind of codependent relationship where uh, he, where he's enriching the heroin dealer by buying his product. And the heroin is gradually causing him to decay and will ultimately in the long run kill him, almost certainly. Um, but not before sort of degrading him to the point of uh, an animal, essentially. Um, and that's the kind of relationship I see with the managerial class and society where like, you know, they, they provide stuff, which is really nice. You know, they, they take the problems away from you. Don't worry. We'll handle the problems. We'll soften the, the hard edges, the sharp, the sharp edges and the corners off of, off of the world and make everything easy for you and frictionless and simple. And then as that goes on, like, you know, you, you, your society kind of degrades like you, you lose your own edge you, lose, yeah. you get weaker you get and, more dependent I, and there might even be like i can interject a, I should... uh, yeah i just want to make um uh, that point uh quickly mark because uh, i think there's actually they there might be a, a kind of deeper spiritual element to it right so the, the heroin dealer um example i think it uh it's pretty spot on uh but uh they're there seems to be almost like a, a kind of exchange with uh, with God, you know, or the universe or whatever. You know, if you if we uh, kind of send out the signal that we want to be treated like children, right? Because uh, we embrace all all this safetyism and and all these procedures, and uh, uh, actually like just lost our moral self sufficiency, right? Then we kind of summon this demon this this kind of um, hyper managerialism which eventually uh, is going to be like a total tyrant and um and that's basically um god sending us a message you know that we there's something wrong you know in our approach and and then we we can react to that uh to that revelation if you will right um because then we see and that's exactly what's happening right i mean people now they're waking up to that even though it's going back a, a long time 
but many people now see it and it's sort of like in Goethe's Mephisto uh, when he says uh, I'm I don't remember the exact quote but you know I'm 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 the one who constantly uh, does evil but at the end does good you know something along those lines so we it's, it's uh, yeah yeah Mephist Mephistopheles uh, said some, what was it, it was uh, um, doing good though intending evil uh, yeah 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 exactly i mean that and that seems to be uh, the dynamic right and we summon this 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 uh demon and but at the end he shows us you know where where we we have slacked you know where we have gone off of the of the straight and narrow so to say and for for a very long time you know and and you you have to look at that in in larger time spans you know it's not that you know today i'm slacking and tomorrow god's gonna you know hit me or something like that it's like uh over decades and centuries you know if we lose our like um strength virtue whatever um eventually uh this tyrant will arise you know it's just what it is and it's a way of an, an opportunity to recognize that something's gone wrong and and you can see these cycles you know like uh, it's not it's like always the same thing right things go wrong and then people recognize it they get their stuff together you know grow and and there's a rena renaissance and all that and then you know these cycles kind of repeat that uh, seems to be a, a sort of feedback thing wasn't there the concept I say Gurdjieff, but maybe it was cast Carlos Castaneda. It was this idea of like the petty tyrant and Definitely. using yeah, it was Castaneda, right? Thank you. Um and like you have these these people that sort of the universe will provide to like test you, essentially. And you know, they're frustrating, they're annoying, they're they're you know, they're even evil, uh in intent at least, but if you approach it the right way, it's like you can use them because like you, by mastering that, uh, you become stronger, you become smarter, wiser, cannier, um, deeper in your soul as a result of that encounter. Uh, which I, I, and yeah, I think actually that is um, a very useful way to think about like, this uh this problem of the managerial class that that has kind of swallowed the world right now this 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 endless annoying system of restrictions that they they put in place it's like okay like this is this is something that needs to be overcome like this needs to be confronted understood but also by overcoming that um we learn very important things about ourselves and uh you know important lessons for our civilization going forward but then you know there's also this this whole thing of like historical dialectic right like um the the sort of yin yang synthesis like thesis antithesis antithesis synthesis kind of kind of movement where it's like okay you know we have this like safety oriented power obsessed managerial system now that so many of us are are chafing under could the reaction to that not itself also become something extremely dark in a few centuries? You know, then that's not an immediate problem, obviously. But um, I mean, certainly I could imagine that you could have a kind of counter tyranny emerging as, as a result, um, because, you know, we just go too far in one direction, which For seems sure. to happen. For sure. It's it's if I, yeah. I could, do you mind if I do you mind if I interject for just a moment? Um, because I want to bring it back to what Harrison was saying before when he's asking us for a definition of what a manager is. And so I've given it a little bit more thought because we, obviously there are all these analogies and metaphors flying around. You know, even the author himself says like, "Oh, you know, bureaucracy is a cancer." Like that's that's as obvious as any any metaphor ever, right? It's, it just grows, grows as as things grow in complexity, they need more. Need to hire more managers. When they hire more managers, they need managers for those managers because the because the, the the thing keeps growing like a cancer, like a cancer. And and now we have like like a drug a drug dealer, and we have all, all kinds of these things. And like when I was saying that, it's older than modernity. Like when we think of the manager, we think now the guy in the suit and he's sitting in the office and he's looking he's looking at paperwork and he's looking at staring at computer screens and all this other stuff. 
So I want to go back and try to add some more into the definition of a manager. And when I think of a manager, not just an intermediary, not just someone who sits in some level between decision and execution, but a scapegoat and a schemer and a toady and someone who is like, again, like someone who, again, wears a kind of a cloak of authority without either having the responsibility that the leader gets, if it's in a society that's has, you know, is worth its salt in any way. And neither has the um, the capacity to execute or gains any responsibility or direct recrimination from that execution. So we're talking we're talking about a manager who has existed forever. This intermediary who's also a toady, who's also a schemer, who's also a potential scapegoat, who's also a potential stool pigeon. Like these are we are talking about a realm. And this is where I do kind of agree with the author. And and where I do understand sort of what he's getting at is that this is a realm of evil, that that, that intermediary space, that space between decision and execution, where you have neither responsibility on either end of that, um, you know, ladder of of dominance or or or, or hierarchy. I think then we if, when we look at the latest form. Of this thing, and I and I'm going to go back to shape shifting because my biggest problem again was tactical. He's getting very technical here. He's applying all kinds of terms and labels. He, yes, he's laying things out in a reasonable order. Yes, I don't really have a significant problem with the way he describes it. It's just at the end of the day, I find it ultimately useless because the thing changes shape. The entire structure, like he's he's describing this structure, which is really just he's not really is more of an artifice on the outside of it because it will change shape again and we will all be caught flat-footed tomorrow it could march out um as a full-blown mystical theocracy right you may you have a bunch of people robed and tattooed people marching the streets looking for children to sacrifice that could happen and he'll just look at that and he'll say well that's a different monster with different priorities but it's not. Aren't you just? Aren't you just describing like pride, Mark? Aren't you just describing pride parades in the current year? <laughs> yes, to some degree. I, I mean, I was going to say like it could be a zombie horde, like it could be Skynet. Whatever form it takes, we're 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 trying to address the heads, the snakeheads that hiss all of these lies instead of looking at the root, because the root doesn't change. The root is right in the center of every individual's human heart. It is not, there is no collective action. That's just a fucking bullshit fantasy lie. That a, 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 an expert, again, a, a rationale. A rationale for the individual evil person to get done what they want to do. And by that, I don't just mean a psychopath. A psychopath might, for the definition that as I understand it, a psychopath might be more akin, the, mo the thing most akin to a human robot. In other words, an input-output mechanism, the way that evil people see all other humans. Right. Like, in other words, the psychopath to a degree is free of responsibility because it's essentially, you know, the, whatever soul <laughs> exists in it is either conquered by something or has been blurred to almost non-existence in some way or blinded in some way. Um, so the I think evil like, person so in, uses the psychopath. The psychopath so, so, doesn't so, use the evil person. I think in, the order is wrong. In, 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 in polarology, you also do have the concepts, uh, if I'm not mistaken that you have kind of like secondary psychopaths um or like situational where like uh once the uh ponerogenesis is taking place and you have your pathocracy um sort of like fully formed uh this then causes people who would otherwise be perfectly normal good not, not necessarily good but you know what i mean like normal people um to become functionally psychopaths like they act as though they were psychopaths they conform themselves to the system uh so they're, they're not all sort of like primary like born that way soulless monsters although those do tend to be the ones that 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 gravitate towards the center of the system um right, right. and i don't yeah, disagree but, with but I, the but, I do, but, I do, upon... but i do see what also you're saying but like but you know like, uh, a psychopath is not really the most evil thing you can imagine right like like true real evil is someone who is not a psychopath and embraces that sort of consciously and those will probably be the ones that do tend to end up at the apex of a system like that 
Well, but uh, or yeah, no, I, maybe I I'm wrong. Really maybe I'm wrong. That. Well, I th this is the way I see it. Like pra practically, from from unless there's well, I know there's stuff going on in the world that I have no access to and has never been written about, and I and the the general public will never know about. But from from the dynamics I've observed and read about in like the real world of humans interacting with each other, psychopaths aren't man very easily manipulable. They are the ones that manipulate other people. Like if you have someone who's manipulating other people to do something, chances are the person being manipulated is a normal person, not a, not a robot, not a, you know, a, and the, and the one doing the manipulating, is the robot is the psychopath is the is the um you know the the reaction machine the input output reaction machine so i i, I don't know if i'd agree with what mark was saying but I, what, what i would say is that as that reaction machine the psychopath is being used by by someone but the someone isn't another human i doubt i doubt it's another human i doubt it's any it's i not, agree I it's and i was going to add do. that I, I was going to add that harrison that like like that i i'm not saying that there aren't powerful psychopaths that are agents and in in, in general i i agree with lubashevsky on this i agree with you on this and and the general idea that these are pathocracies that these are these are maybe at some level useful ways of describing what we're fighting but at a, another level, at a deeper level, so like, for instance, I was thinking about this because you, you gentlemen have changed my mind about a few things. And like one of the things is, I, OK, so let's let's say let's take for granted the root of this essay, which is that there is a managerial regime, that this is essentially a rule by the emissary or a rule by the toady or a rule by the, you know, whatever you want to call this bureaucrat. This this person this pencil this this paper shuffling pencil pusher class that has somehow arisen that that you typically gets their orders from above right and then uses that to scheme because all ultimately down deep I have not changed my mind on this they all see themselves as the potential next ruler as the god of their own dimension in wait you know and, and like sometimes it's just sort of like you know it's very mundane they're just sort of like i'm the god of this floor of my building or i'm eventually going to take over the agency because everyone else is an idiot and i'm secretly the one in charge like that's the mentality in a lot of ways and so if you have an entire class of people which is the central theme of this this piece you have an entire class of these people that have somehow ascended which doesn't even really make any sense but let's say that it makes sense to say that the managerial class is now in charge they're not. So that would mean that there's something higher there. They are receiving a directive from somewhere. There is a director somewhere because a managerial cast cannot rule by definition. Mm -hmm. I'm just talking about the basic definition of words here. You can't say managers are the decision makers, but they're still managers. And then, and then of course, the question is, the question is who rules, right? So, um, right. you know, I'm saying it's, so it's not know, semantics I'm like, saying though. You understand? So you, you, yeah. you, you have, you have people like, um, there's like Eugippius who uh, insists that no, in fact, no one rules. Curtis Yarvin says the same thing, you know, that uh, in order to exert power, you have to be visible because reasons, um, which I've always kind of thought, okay, but like you only have to be visible to the people who are high enough like you you can you can sort of cloak yourself from the general population and be visible to the people who are sort of like the the penultimate level of of the pyramid so to speak right um that's you know you, you can easily have a cryptocracy like that and i think we i think we actually do then okay if that's the case then what's there is it like literally the devil like is it like a fucking demon um okay that's a possibility well, well, uh, I mean, but, but no it is I mean, absolutely people, but not, like, think not, about it I'm psychopaths not, I'm not, yeah I'm not, I'm not, I'm, not jo I'm not joking when i say that <laughs> like okay. um but then, uh, you know, you also have uh, people like Cliff, High, like Uncle Cliff, for instance, you know, Cliff High, um, and he calls it the bug. Uh, so he thinks it's aliens, um, you know, off world or, or hyperdimensional or ex ex ultra terrestrial or whatever the hell they are, uh, like something which is sort of implanted itself at this apex and has been guiding the system for the purpose of conquering humanity. Um, I sort of look at the and I'm like, well, I don't have any direct proof that this is the case. Uh, 
I don't even see also Occam's two. razor I, says I, devil I, because I, like why they could conquer us if they could conquer us they just conquer us. Uh, what we see instead is a miseration. We see we see people that are of, being let to destroy themselves and each other. That I that is a like, quite a I, different Mark, sadistic I, motive. I feel like you're looking at it from a like you know if there were an alien invasion it would be, it would look like Independence Day. You know the motherships. Yeah, there were, are different ways of but, conquering or different different yes. understandings of what it means to conquer. Yes, absolutely. Exactly. But but again, so like, it's, but again, I would say and, that it requires and, and, more twists so like, and turns and so un, just, unknown like, information. If if I think about it in terms of like energetics, right? Um, like, let's say that you happen to so all the time you need because you know, your lifespan. Maybe maybe you live for a hundred thousand years, right? Like you know, we don't fucking know. Um, and you know you've got you've got this perspective on time that like stretches over you know millennia very the way we think of days uh and you know this actually might even be necessary if we're talking about something interstellar well then okay how would you set about conquering another species would you do it by sending this huge fleet of ships to burn their cities to the ground or something like that yeah, it's probably energetically very expensive what if you just send a very small force that uh sort of insinuates itself at the top of the local hierarchies and then just kind of guides the society in the direction you want it to go such that when you show up they all throw your throw themselves at your at your feet without you firing a shot. Um, okay, so yeah. but then like what well, then then motive gets called into question because like what is the yes. use of the con of yes. the invasion? So let me and then it's not just motive that comes into question. I hundred percent agree because like, because like because like what what are they after uh, right like. You know, like they're not after, like, it wouldn't be physical resources because, like, you know, space is full of, you know, if you want gold, go mine a fucking asteroid. Like, you know, no one's shooting at you. Uh, so it's it's, it's not going to be that. Um, is it is it our DNA? Like, I don't think so because, like, to gather DNA, like, you just go and take a few samples from the local biosphere. You don't even need to say hello to. Anyone. So, like that, I think we can rule that out too. Um, what is it dude i don't know <laughs> exactly this is my point you still haven't gotten rid of your devil problem if there are aliens from dimension x and they're coming to conquer us slowly by this very mysterious and, and intricate method it's sort of like well then they the devil is control of them too you could say because it's still or, evil so it's sort of like so you still have to have a root motive but, but, that is like, Mark, i guess i guess i guess what i was kind of getting is is um you have devil worshiping aliens are, from Dimension X. That's all. You could right, be referring like, demons, so, aliens. What I'm you can't, to you can't like, escape like, it. Are, these, the same entity, are, are these, it is. are these really are these really distinct concepts? Right. This is what like I was you're talking about, like with, you know X. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Like, like that was what I, I really liked in your article, Harrison. Was like, you know, you're, you're like, okay, so like, you know, you have your spiritual dimension, you have your your physical dimension. The spiritual has to act through the physical um but you know that doesn't the existence of one does not rule out the other basically like there there's a there's a, a necessary synergy there uh and like you know both perspectives by switching back and forth between them you you sort of see important elements that weren't there before like the spiritual aspect isn't necessarily going to tell you much about how this works at the level of mechanism right but the level of mechanism isn't going to tell you much about uh the sort of final causes that are ultimately sort of like you know um uh motivating the entire thing um yeah. and I, I, th I think that's a, a good way of looking at it actually and and you know because some of you br brought up the question you know do we have um uh or oh yeah whether it's like an autopilot kind of thing or whether there's something behind it and my take sorry is that um the, the uh, like the cabal you know the human cabal kind of thing that's probably not really how it works and i tend more towards a yeah let's say a, a more spiritual kind of understanding of of that sort of thing um and you might ask you know how, how can i know you know or i don't have any direct proof of that either but um but what i noticed and i think that's 
I, it always puzzled me. You know, when you look at history, both the the history of ideas, but also like just actual history, uh, how it played out, it's not, you know, or, or you, you got to ask yourself the question, how on earth did we get where we are now, right? How on earth was that possible? And uh, it's not, I mean, there, there's no law, you know, saying that's how it should go, right? That, that It's just, you read history, uh, you read the history of ideas, and there's always these, there are always these moments where it could have gone differently, right? Where where it's just, uh, you know, there's a new um, religious movement uh, that is really great, you know, um, or there's um, some political ideas that are that are really good. There's um, <clears throat> some, you know, like uh, and studying of antiquity and of the Greek philosophers, and some people like really figured things out and and were some decent ideas, and and they were being taught, and and people were educated, and then suddenly, you know, this again like disappeared. There's always these these little um, nudges, you know, throughout history, if you look at- That at always it, like, make things go to shit. Like, yeah, yeah. They, they always you, make you, things right. go to, to, to shit. And, and also they kind of conspire, you know, over like large stretches of time to produce exactly where we are at now, because this is not some something that j just fell from the sky, right? I mean, there's all these kinds of intellectual currents, all these historical currents, and, and they all kind of like a puzzle piece fit together perfectly to produce this absolute crazy world. And especially if you're reading history, you realize the extent of the craziness will, I mean, the extent of like our warped worldview these days, right? The, the, the complete upside down of, of, of everything and and we often don't even notice it you know um but if you if you study history um and all the uh you know and I, the history of ideas it's kind of becomes apparent how how weird this all is and how many factors have gone into it so i mean you could of, of course argue it's all just all the coincidence or whatever but but usually the people who argue against is sort of like a hidden hand you know uh they uh, invoke some automatisms, right? That just, you know, some mechanisms that just play themselves out and that's just how we got here. But um, I don't, I, I don't know how you can come to that conclusion if you, if you actually, you know, look into it. So that, that's well, sort I think of my what, I think what makes, I think what, what makes the, 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 the emergent mechanical thinking uh, sort of way of looking at, these developments so um plausible at first glance to so many people is that when you look around at the world the majority of people really do think it again these days they really do behave like automatons um and that of course is i think a consequence of exactly those historical developments you're talking about that have led us to this kind of um collective madness that we're trapped in uh but you know when you when you when you when you see that all around if you're like a, kind of a, a clever person who isn't sort of thinking in terms of spirituality uh because of course that's not a respectable way to think because of again those 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 uh reasons current right because reasons right exactly um then uh then you know that's the kind of conclusion you're going to come to because like you see everyone acting like a bunch of automata and um you're like okay well you know that's it's just the blind forces of evolution and natural selection and the you know world of ideas and that have led us to this path this this this, this pass right uh and you know frankly i think there's also an element of like um i don't want to say cowardice but uh you know, considering the alternative possibility that this has all been guided over the course of thousands of years by forces that we don't directly perceive um, for whatever reason is quite terrifying. Or is it liberating in some way? You know, I was thinking it's, about like the... Yeah. Um, the, yeah. the, 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 the so there's a point where he starts talking about the 2016 panic of the elite 
managerial regime. And I made a note of it because I was just sort of like, it seemed like the reason he said, like, they were panicking because they were losing control of this great progressive project that, that was going to move forward into utopian, sunny uplands of efficiency, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, nah, like they're panicking. They're clearly panicking. Like, that's obvious. You could see it in their eyes. I remember I was looking at um, Diane Feinstein. You know, you look at this person and like she's 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 I mean, she you look at her. She thinks she's running late for like a voting session on Pluto. Like, well, in reality, she's she's just at a nursing home choking on Jello, Right. But she's but you could see it in her eyes. You could see the panic. You could see that these, these oxygenarian weirdos are still hanging on with this death grip to the wheels of power. And like the fucking lights right there, it's coming straight for them. And they, they they can see it and they're panicking. That's the real panic. The panic, I think, is that they were promised something. They were promised something like eternal life through technology and medicine their entire lives, all these boomers. And you know, these are the people that grew up with the Jetsons and everything the fuck else, where they're just sort of like, yeah, don't worry about it. We're going to solve that whole death thing. Way before, like, you're going to be an 80-year-old, um, you know, apparatchik who's like, who's like, who, who just can't let go of power because they've been taught that, like, power will lead to eternal life in the flesh. And so, like, this is the panic that we're seeing now. I, it's, it's, it started before 2016. I, I've been seeing it for 20 years now, I feel like, in various ways and in various shapes. Again, this thing sh shifts shape over time. It's, it wakes up as a new thing every morning. Um, and it's sort of like, but it really is panic now. Like they're really panicking. They're thinking like, oh my God, oblivion's right around the corner. I'm going to die. And then, and then what? And then I waste my whole life exploiting well, and, it, and it hurting people like, in, in, in pursuit of power and it advantage. Like, and like, like, and then like, when you're staring into that void, it's going to, it's, it's it, man, you're going to fucking panic. It's going to look crazy. Like it does now. I think. Go ahead, John. Sorry. I get the sense they're working to a clock a lot of the time. Like there's some kind of deadline. Um, and, you know, maybe that's what you just described. You know, it's like these octogenarians who um, the the transhuman, you know, life extension, immortality future has not manifested in time for them to avoid the grim reaper and reckoning with the, the maker that they have offended throughout their lives through their, their uh, numerous sins uh, in the, deep in their black hearts to answer for maybe that's it uh maybe it's something else made of deadline and you know so okay like if we run with that hypothesis uh the scenario that like there's been something guiding all of these historical developments and philosophy and science and governance and what have you all down through the millennia in order to bring us where we are here uh and doing so in a very deliberate sort of conscious fashion um something which is not human like x you know uh okay well like if it's going if it's like, say it's got a goal right um and maybe that goal is meant to manifest pretty soon uh sort of around this historical time and they've done all this work and here the the deadline is approaching it's make or break you know shit or get off the pot and suddenly, things are going haywire. Donald Trump gets elected. Brexit happens. Uh, you have these populist movements breaking out all over the place. You know, you have like the herd is all of a sudden no longer doing what it's told as reliably, and they should be conditioned by now. All all the behavioral operant conditioning should have made them into perfect little slaves. And sure, a lot of them are. A lot of them are firmly asleep, completely mechanical in their thoughts. Like the conditioning is taken absolutely wonderfully. Um, but there's a bunch of them that, that, that are not and, and their numbers are spreading and they're becoming harder and harder to manage. And thus the panic, because what if it all comes crashing down? Right. Um, what if all of their hard work, all of their carefully laid plans, all just don't, don't work. And, you know, like, uh, to get like less esoteric, but still firmly in the sort of conspiracy sphere, you can like look at stuff like, you know, the Kalergi plan that Tree of Woe did a, a bit of a deep dive on a couple of months ago, where he sort of like looked into, okay, what did this guy actually write? And, um, and it was pretty much like, 
it read like a, a prophecy for you know the rest of the 20th century in terms of like you know what they wanted to do um and you know so you could also just have this like you know group of like humans kind of like, you know, old banking families or whatever in europe who have been trying to sort of like conquer the world by stealth who have who have done all of this work to sort of uh to to put together this this global system that will have them sitting on top of it or their descendants sitting on top of it for the rest of time um under a, a humanity that will ultimately become engineered to enjoy its servitude you know the chris langdon's parasitic divergence right where the earth kind of goes through like a phase change um from which no reversal is possible uh and okay this is a bit scattered actually but you know um this kind of what if the deadline they're working towards is an understanding that the earth will in fact go through some kind of phase shift at about this time in its development you know akin to when it went from a dead world to a living a biogenic event uh four and a half billion years ago or when multicellular life came along or when you know humans developed language right like what if we're coming up to like another sort of event like that and you know you see people talking about like the technological singularity for instance i don't think it's that per se but uh you know like there's this kind of intimation that a lot of people have that you know this time in history is very special and you do see this acceleration in technology and all of these things happening okay so you know, and, and well, Chris Langan, like he sort of talks about how you can have either the tech singularity or human singularity on the, and, and which path humanity chooses uh, determines the state that the earth will be in for, um, you know, maybe not like the rest of time, because ultimately, the, you know, the sun eats the earth or whatever, uh, but like, you know, for a long time to come, right? Um, and it's essentially, it's an irreversible shift. Uh, and if we go the human singularity route, then you know the parasites they they're, they're fucked they're fucked forever like they're they're never getting back in power they're never never going to get their their parasitic divergence and their their tech singularity where they sit like an effendi and eat as the rest of us toil in their uh virtual fields or whatever uh with like brain chips controlling our minds and all of these kinds of things like they'll never get that um and perhaps all of this sort of thousands of years of of sort of careful curation of the human ideational sphere uh, has been grooming the species to just kind of like fall into the attractor state of the of the parasitic divergence without even realizing where it's going. And the reason they're panicking is that that inflection point is soon. I, they. I'm sure they don't know exactly when. I think it's impossible to know exactly when it would happen. Um, it's it's quite possible that it's like sort of we're in that nexus right now historically, and it, if they don't get their way, they're fucked, and they know it. And they're then they 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 feel the control slipping that is necessary for them to kind of yank humanity in that direction, which is why they're panicking. And sort of coming out from behind the, the mask more and more and acting openly and sort of, uh, you know, becoming more heavy handed with their, their, their various tactics because uh, the time is short for them, right? Um, but the flip side of that is that time is short for us, right? Like, you know, we also don't have much time to act. And like, you know, the future is. The future is not set. Like there's no such thing as prophecy. There's only sort of a cloud of probability in the future. And like, you know, how they want a 100% probability of getting their way. And they kind of maybe convinced themselves that they had that. And maybe that, that probability is now like, you know, 98% that they will get their way but they've seen the probability of the human singularity increasing ever so slightly in the last, you know, few years. 
And that is why they panic. So like what, what I'm kind of getting at there is like just we should not be uh um complacent and be like, oh, humanity's awakening, the the harmonic convergence is coming, and you know, like like they're fucked. It's like, yeah, no, like we could still be pretty much fucked as far as the probability goes. It could be that we have this like very, very narrow sliver of probability that we can sort of and we and we can widen that, but like, you know, like the odds are still stacked against us. Right. So like, you know, basically we need to fight like fucking demons or maybe angels would be a better. <laughs> yeah, but I agree, John. Sure. Put me in, Coach. You know, I, I I'm not uh, I'm not ready to give up anything. I I agree that. I agree sorry, sorry. I just, that... Want, I just want. I just want, I just want to say like uh, those are my closing. Well, that was, that was good. Those are good closing points, and you guys have given me a lot to think about with this article. I, I am going to write about it a bit. I do want to be fair to the author. It's not in any way an offense against him. You know, like when I say I just didn't feel the same value. Um, that I guess John and some of some of the rest of you did. Like I, when I got to the end of 155 minutes or however many how many words it was, I felt like I agreed the things that I agreed with, I thought were fairly obvious. Um, and the things that I disagreed with mainly had to do with what was not included. Uh, but again, I'm new, I'm new to this author and and I will try to read. I know he had some links to some of his former work, so I will try to catch up on that before I do a write-up uh, because I hate this idea of like, okay, I read this, I engaged this, and like I, I came away with um, a certain set of uh, frustrations. Uh, but I, but you, you've all given me quite a bit to think about. So thank you for that. Uh, Luke, Harrison, Dan, anyone? Yeah, I just want to um, maybe underline a point, Mark, that you made earlier, um, just uh, to, to remind us all of that. And that is that evil comes in different forms, right? And uh, and we should not um, mistake one specific form for the thing itself. And, uh, you know, should there be some kind of like um, inflection point coming up or something, um, you know, it's, I mean, evil will always shape shift and uh, we should probably do a show on evil uh, because of that <laughs> at some point, uh, because the managerial state, I mean, it. I think it's still very um important to study it and that's what i valued in this article as well i think he put it very well um you know um, how, how this whole thing works uh, and it can give us hints and clues as to the nature of evil uh, important hints but it, it is not the thing itself and we should remember that i mean there could be for all we know like a, a, I, I like to think about what would like a libertarian uh hellhole look like you know i mean what what if they they come up you know with a libertarian idea uh, and that use that as their next cloak you know <laughs> who knows but i mean there could be all kinds of things right and so i think the libertarian hellhole is a mixture of uh um heroin cola being sold in vending <laughs> machines surface to air missiles on every front lawn and <laughs> child consents yeah or different different community small communities who are all living We're by just themselves. a bunch of smug but, but guys but... walking around in sandals and 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 <laughs> telling you about ayn rand you know <laughs> <laughs> sorry libertarians i love you yeah we, we all love you but uh you know my image is like small communities that are all kind of like living a, apart from each other, like libertarian utopia style, but they're all evil to the core, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, something like that. Well, no closing thoughts for me, just that this has been fun and look forward to the next time. Yeah, I'd say more Take or less care, the same is, uh, is a good a lot to think about and i think one of the things with mark what you're saying uh, it's maybe uh you know he, ns lines is describing a tool or a system that uh, then there's what's using that tool or system that you're addressing which is evil and uh i mean with evil you know i guess basic definition causing harm um you know you, you can't cause harm without some level of deception because otherwise nobody would cooperate with you. Nobody would go along with your, you know, if you're trying to harm them in some way. And so it's like the managerial system provides evil with a lot of places to hide, a lot of little different masks to wear to disguise itself. And, uh, but now that's kind of causing attention because 
you know, on the one hand, there's um, the need for evil to hide itself and, and disguise itself. And then on the other hand, there's the need for evil to act in the world effectively. And it's not a, it kind of has to sacrifice its ability to disguise itself and hide itself for its ability to act in the world. And maybe that's what we're seeing now. Some of it, the mask coming off, some of it more just naked and obvious power grabs and, and just, you know, flexes. Um, and so anyway, you know, I think the, the managerialism is, is definitely a part of it, but um, all the stuff that you were saying, Mark and John, you know, in, in kind of the higher order analysis, I think this uh, resonates with me and is a lot to, to think about. Um, so anyway, enjoy the discussion. Thanks everybody participated. Uh, you know, if, if nobody else has anything, I could just say, you know, thanks for joining the Tonic 7, aka today the Tonic 5 with uh i just want to say dan like that 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 final wrap-up point you made there i think is something that bears dwelling on uh by everyone because there exact there is because it, it, it is this kind of cryptocracy there is in fact a trade-off for them between keeping themselves cloaked and acting in the world and like sort of like to whatever degree they act openly, they actually are drawing down their long-term power. And this is kind of um, possibly one of their greatest weaknesses. Uh, Definitely. Yeah. It's a, it's a time of vulnerability for them. Like it's hard to get a read on the situation, you know, given, I, I mean, what Luke was talking about it. Luke, you said it very well. You, you look back at history and all these times where it seems like things got nudged. It's like it could have worked. And then there's this fatal flaw, this this thing that kind of got manipulated or twisted just to steer it off course into ruin, you know. And, and you see that often enough in all these threads of what seemed like a very high level of coordination among people that it's hard to explain that without there being some kind of, I don't know, spirit realm you know whatever i mean among psychopaths even just looking at in the united states like the communists long march through the institutions and like these are people that many of them took low status low paying you know jobs in nonprofit foundations or in education or whatever with this ideology in mind like oh uh, it was really like a religion and you know that ability for people who are essentially psychopaths when you look at their morals and some of the things that they advocate and will do, I mean, like the weather underground people, you know, uh, for them to defer their own self-interest to pursue, you know, if self-sacrificingly or anonymously, this long-term project, you know, it seems like there's, there's something coordinating that and it's hard to find that in the material, strictly material realm, you know? So anyway, Anybody else have anything or are we ready to call it a... No, let's shut it down. All right. Everybody, yeah, let's uh, go to join us next time. <laughs>